Hello, welcome back. So in this video, we're going to be using um, three chemicals to make a very obscure oxidizer called uh, potassium nickel pyridate. No, sodium potassium. I don't know why I've written potassium nickel pyridate. We're not using potassium. Sodium nickel pyridate. This is very interesting because it contains nickel in the plus four oxidation state, which is very, very rare for nickel in a very high oxidation state. To start with, we've got some nickel nitrate. So I made this from nickel carbonate is what I brought from a pottery store, I think, in the US quite a while back, and I used that nitric acid we got from the suck back the other day. Um, that was meant to be red fuming nitric acid, but ended up being quite um, somewhat more dilute. Nice Doritos container for it. We've got our sodium pyridate, which we made the other day using chlorine and um, sodium iodide. And we have here a ammonium persulfate, which is a chemical I don't use very often, but have quite a lot of, as you can see here. So nickel here is nickel two, which is this lovely green color, and that's the standard oxidation state of nickel. The nickel one species are that unheard of. Um, there's quite a lot of nickel zero sort of complexes, um, metal organic stuff. Nickel three is rare, you know, very rare, and same with nickel four is very exceedingly rare. Uh, we're kind of winging it here. I've got, I've got some odd details from um, a paper I uh, published a little while ago, um, but they didn't use any exact amount of anything. They just, I think they just chose round numbers and went with it. But it's at least proof that this should definitely work. We're going to add about 500 mils to this nickel solution here. And we want it to warm up once it gets about 80 degrees. We're close to boiling, really. You can see it's the lovely nickel 2 colour. And then once it's hot enough, we'll add in our sodium pyridate, which is here. We've got 14 grams to add in. And while it's heating up, I think it's worth mentioning why we want to make this. Um, apart from the fact that it's interesting, because it's quite an obscure reagent, and hopefully there should be some nice colours. The real reason we want to make this is that pyridonicolates or nickel pyridates are one of the few chemical oxidizers that can successfully oxidize bromates to perbromates, uh, apparently. Really, what we're chasing here is perbromates. And it's not because perbromates are some super oxidizer or something like that. It's just because they're assholes and don't want to be made. I'll explain more in the perbromate videos, but um, it's quite a rare event to actually have some perbromates. So I think it'd be quite good if we managed to get some. We need some nitric acid, so it needs to be slightly acidic. The paper mentions that uh, it needs to be slightly acidic for it to work, but it doesn't work if it's too acidic. So <laughs> it's one of those vague, you know, how acidic is too acidic, what sort of acidity level, we're just gonna have to guess that. I, I have a feeling I don't want it to be too basic when I add all this pyridate in, because this might be quite basic because it's the author pyridate or whatever. Um, and if we precipitate out all nickel hydroxide and stuff, then it might, you know, just make the synthesis cactus from the start. So just gonna add in a splash of nitric acid and then once after we add all this um, orthopyridate in, then we can hopefully adjust the pH. The thing I didn't want it to in that it went quite basic as I added the rest of the sodium pyridate. The first half was alright. Oh, calm the fuck down. First half was alright, but second half was just too much pyridate for the acid I added. But that's fine, I think we've adjusted it. So it's a weird browny grey colour, which I think is what we want. So now it's just a matter of trying to dissolve all the orthopyridate, which I'm fairly sure is what that suspension is. Um, so we may have to add extra water um, and just get it as hot as possible to try and dissolve everything up. It's a little hard to see, but we've got two solids in here. So we've got some sort of flocculent nickel precipitate, and we've still got just a little bit of pyridate down the bottom there. You can see the difference in those two solids. So that one settling quickly is the pyridate, which we're just trying to dissolve the last off. An improvement for next time would definitely be to, I think, dissolve up all the pyridate first, adjust the pH, you know, then you can make sure everything's dissolved at the right pH, and then you can add the nickel. Because the nickel nitrate is going to dissolve, it's so soluble, it's going to dissolve in anything. All right, everything's dissolved. Unfortunately, we only have ammonium bisulfate, which I think is going to severely lower our yield. It's all I have. I don't have any sodium bisulfate. So we're just going to use this, and hopefully we still get enough product out of it. Just going to add a spoonful at a time, and hopefully we start seeing some color change or something. Got to this colour in about two minutes. <laughs> this is the colour I thought it was going to go eventually after a couple of hours, but I don't know, I added about three teaspoons 
this. I think we're gonna add a little bit more of this um, and then just stir it for quite a while. It's not like we can over oxidize it. <laughs> you know, there's nothing more to go to past nickel four, so might as well just add in some extra stuff and then, and then we'll just stir it for a while. In the paper, it stirs it at 80 degrees for four hours. It does look like it's slowly bubbling. It's a bit hard to see. It could just be boiling, but I think it's an interesting observation that it's giving off a gas of some sort. I assume it's oxygen in this kind of environment, but who knows. I think it's the right colour. Uh, the colour was meant to be red, ready black, which is, I think, exactly this. Alright, I've stopped the heating. I think this is about as good as we're going to get it, so hopefully it all settles out. There's a lot of hopefuls in there, but I feel like it will. You can sort of see the particles of it around the side there, so it's definitely a suspension, but hopefully it settles out nicely and uh, let's just filter it out. Alright, I let it stand in the fridge overnight and we have a nice, I'm going to shine some light through it, got a nice precipitate there down at the bottom. It's kind of a brick red colour, which is different than what it was yesterday. Well, the suspension was kind of purpley black, but now we've got a brick red solid over a slightly green solution. Um, I'm just going to put some filter paper in there, you know, above the frit too, because I'm worried this part was might be very really small, because they did take a while to settle. And I don't want anything travelling through the filter, so I'm just going to put some filter paper in there. Yeah, it's exactly what I thought might happen. So the, the green stuff, there's a liquid on the top, um, but you can see the stuff's passing right through the filter and the filter paper, so. All right, it's really not filtering, but I managed to get a little bit, um, and it's got this really weird look to it. Oh, I forgot its side, I think it's easier to see. See, it's got a really weird, like, metallic sheen to it. It's sort of like a lot like permanganate in that sense, but it's more sort of steel gray. There's obviously a lot more to get. Um, but I just managed to, it's only this amount was really caught in the filter paper there uh, and went through and then I dried it with some acetone. Well, I guess we've got, we've got to go about recovering all the rest of it but um, is there's enough there to, to test some properties out so uh, while I'm collecting the rest of this we can actually do some testing to see if it's the thing we actually want. Alright so we've got our solid here, let's try and see its solubility in three different conditions. So I'm just going to add a small amount to each test tube. So complex is meant to be insoluble in water, which is definitely what we see. It's also insoluble in um, dilute acids. If it was like a nickel oxide, any sort of nickel oxide, it would easily dissolve in that acid and we would see a nice green colour from the um, nickel 2. However, in strong bases, we see that it does dissolve um, to form a brown solution. This is, this is um, what should happen according to literature 2, so this is good evidence once again. And we do see that it does give off a few bubbles there, so I don't think it's that stable in this solution. I presume those bubbles are oxygen, although I don't really have a way of testing that. After about four days, um, we can see that the, just the water solution has taken on a bit of a purple colour. Um, this is the same colour it was when it was in suspension, rather than that sort of metallic grey it was when it was dry. Whereas the acid solution is still perfectly clear, so we can see that it's really only basic solutions dissolve it and to a certain extent, it has some sort of reaction with water. Well, not reaction with water, some sort of hydrate or something, possibly. Next up, we have some concentrated hydrochloric. Um, I know it's not soluble in dilute acids, but perhaps we can oxidize this to chlorine or something. All right, well, there's nickel too. <laughs> All right, we'll give it a quick smell. Yeah, yeah, no, it's definitely chlorine coming off that. So we're definitely oxidizing it to chlorine, for sure. No doubt about that. Oh, disgusting. So what we really need to do is we need to test for iodine. So uh, first I'm going to get some dilute nitric acid here. Just put a little bit. Next I'm going to add some of our complex. So just a small amount once again. Here's our complex. Next, what I'm going to do is, uh, a real big indicator for iodine is starch. So I have some <laughs> spray starch here for use in ironing. Just did some tests before and this is a pretty good indicator for um, periodate. So I'm just going to... What we can do is we can add a really mild reducing agent 
like uh, I've got some potassium thiocyanate here um, and I'm just going to add one crystal of that to this. So if there's any pyridate or any iodate in this complex, um, it'll react with the thiosulfate, reduce down to iodine and then react with the starch to form a very dark coloured com complex. So that's what we should see if there's any iodine in the complex. It's not the classic starch iodine um, complex colour, but this is the same colour I went when I just put in my straight pyridate. That um, really tells us that there's iodine in our complex, it's not some weird um, nickel species, so that's great. Now we've done the characterization and we're confident that what we have is our um, sodium pyridonicolate. We can really have a look and see about our yield. And our yield actually in the end was only 1.1 grams. That's not including all the stuff we have to use for testing. Um, but we really didn't use that much for testing. I think really, I mean 0.1 gram at the most, I'd say. There was a lot of mechanical losses because of the, the, the difficulty filtering it. I had to gravity filter it through um, a lot of filter paper to actually get all the stuff out. It's worth noting the interesting color. I mean, it's, it's kind of a, a, a steel gray, but when it's crushed, it ends up being this, this purple color. So the powder is a different color than um, the bulk material. It's not too much of an odd phenomenon, but it's still really quite lovely to look at. We've really got the maximum amount out of this solution. So, I mean, the, the yield of nickel, like nickel's whatever, you know, nickel's pretty cheap and I have quite a bit of it and I don't use it very often. So I don't mind you know, making lots of nickel nitrate and having a low yield based on nickel. What's annoying is the low yield based on pyridate because we use like 14 grams or something and, you know, it took us all day to make 16 grams. I mean, I could just scale that reaction up and you could have a whole heap of pyridate, but um, I don't have heaps of iodide and the iodide's expensive and not something I want to be buying all the time. I'll have to think about whether I have to do this again and to get more of our complex in order for the perbromate synthesis to be a success. I would like to have reasonable quantities of perbromate, you know, that we can actually work with rather than really micro scale stuff. I hope you enjoyed this video anyway. I'm making a quite an obscure oxidation state, very high oxidation state, and I'll, I'll see you in the next video, whatever that one is.